Hi, and welcome to the second of two sessions on computational creativity. Uh, very glad to have you here. My name is Matthew Gustile, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Alberta and a Canadian CIFAR chair at the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. And I'll be chairing the session. Uh, we've got three incredible speakers and panelists for you in this session. Um, I'll introduce them each in full before their talk, but at a high level, uh, we can say hello to everybody. We have Dr. Maya Ackerman from Santa Clara University, Dr. Mike Cook from Queen Mary University London, and Dr. Mikhail Jacob from Microsoft Research. All right, so uh, we will have our live Q&A with all the speakers at the end of the session, but please go ahead and drop questions into the moderated Q&A as you think of them and upvote any you'd especially like to hear answered uh, towards the end of the session. We'll see how much time we have left. Hopefully we can go through as many as possible, but I'm sure we're gonna get a lot. Okay, with that, we're going to go ahead and move towards our very first speaker of the day, uh, Dr. Maya Ackerman. Uh, Maya Ackerman will be our first speaker. She's also the only speaker in the session who I don't know personally, though I know her work quite well, having been seen several of her presentations, the most recent one in Spain, actually, in 2018. Um, Dr. Maya Ackerman is an award-winning artificial intelligence expert named Woman of Influence by the Silicon Valley Business Journal. Currently, Maya is a computer science and engineering professor at Santa Clara University and the CEO slash co-founder of Wave AI. Her research focusing on computational creativity and cluster analysis has earned awards from the Association for Computational Creativity, U.S. Office of Naval Research, Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, and many more. A sought after speaker, Maya has been invited speaker at the United Nations, Google, IBM Research, and Stanford University, amongst others. She earned her PhD from the University of Waterloo and held postdoctoral fellowships at Caltech and UC San Diego. She is also a singer and music producer. We're going to get a little, at least a little bit of a taste of that uh, during her presentation today. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Maya. Please take it away. Thank you so much for the introduction. Just going to go to the beginning here. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, so let's get started. We're going to talk today about the musical AI landscape, looking at composition, improvisation, and songwriting. And towards the end, we're going to look at some interesting opportunities at the, inter at the intersection of musical AI and gaming. So let's start with composition. That's typically what people think of when they think of musical AI. So um, not a lot of people know that, but musical AI actually began back in uh, in around the 1950s and in particular in 1980s in the 1980s David Cope made a system called experiments in musical intelligence uh, Amy for short and it was able to create music in the style of a wide range of classical composers such as Vivaldi and Bach and Mozart and uh, early on there's a little story that I like to tell early on uh, in uh, the development of Amy when he had music in the style of, of Bach, he brought this music to a music conference and said that um, a new Bach piece has been discovered. And everybody got really excited and they heard the piece and they thought this was really wonderful, exciting news. And then he told them that it was made with the computer system and they were really disappointed and actually upset about that. So that sort of uh, gives a hint for the kind of resistance that exists to musical AI and to some degree, unfortunately, still persists today. You can listen to a lot of Amy's compositions just directly on YouTube. I highly recommend doing that. Like most people, I can't tell the difference between David Cope's music created with Amy uh, and that of the original classical composers that the system tries to imitate. In fact, only experts tend to be able to differentiate between the two. So while there is a lot of activity on um, generating music in academia, there has been relatively little of that in industry. And it's only in recent years that people started taking, taking the research and building out this kind of technology in industry. Two of the most notable players are Ava and Emperor. Uh, you can actually play around with Ava online. It's really fun. Uh, Amper was a fairly similar product than it recently exited. So really, Ava remains uh, the only dominant player in, in the commercial space for musical AI. 
So the way these systems typically work is you come in and you make a few simple presets. You select genre, you might select mood, a few really simple selections. Then the AI system actually does most of the heavy lifting, so it creates most of the music. And finally, you usually have the option to do some little edits at the end. So again, most of the work in this context is done by the musical AI itself. This type of systems typically are used to do background music. So for example, if somebody has a movie and they want some background music for it that has a certain mood, then they might use a generated system. That's one of the, the most common use cases. And we'll talk a little bit more about how this can be used in gaming towards the end. Another really, really fun direction is um, improvisational music. So making music together with a computer live, much like you would with a human musician. This is actually, in my opinion, one of the best examples of humans collaborating with machines in general. By far, my favorite system is called Impro-Visor. It's freely available online. It takes a little bit of work to set it up, but it's well worth the effort. And within it, there is what's called a trading capability. So you can hook up a musical instrument or even just sing into it, and it's going to improvise back. So you kind of take turns. You improvise, it improvises, and sort of back and forth like that. The system was developed by my late colleague, Robert Keller, uh, who unfortunately passed away several months ago. Um, and he definitely created, uh, I think, the best improvisational system out there. I remember uh, during a conference where I was first introduced to the system, I ended up playing with it for a full hour. And I always struggled with piano improvisation, but somehow improvising back and forth with the machine was, was really my first experience of successfully improvising. So there is this immense uh, educational value Dr. Keller used to run uh, an improvisational class at Harvey Mudd where students would take the class not to do any sort of development necessarily, but to musically improvise with the system. So there's really immense value in this. I highly recommend checking it out. Um, I had a chance uh, to collaborate with Dr. Keller on what we called mind music. So instead of improvising uh, with improviser through a musical instrument like a MIDI piano, uh, we had, uh, we introduced the ability to improvise through your brain signals. So we made it so, uh, sort, of, sort of a pretty simple prototype here, where if you're relaxed, then it's going to generate slower music. And if the mind is either anxious or just more active, you're actively trying to solve a problem, uh, then the music is going to be faster. So I'm going to show you a little clip here. They see Rachel here trying to intentionally focus on a problem to change those brain signals. And then in a moment, you'll see her trying to relax. You'll see she's trying to relax until the music is slowing down. And you see this, uh, this Muse device here. The Muse device that she's wearing is reading her brain signals, and that's what's letting her control this one aspect of the music. But there's a lot more potential here to extract a lot more brain information, so not just active or relaxed, in order to improvise together with an AI system, but using your, using your brain signals instead of through an instrument. Uh, this is another system. It's actually a very young project that I'm doing uh, with my students. Zach and William, and um, the opportunity that we saw is to find the right balance with an improvisation system. So currently we have systems that are absolutely fantastic, like like improviser, but they're very complicated. There are a lot of a lot of a um, lot of learning that needs to happen before you can easily uh, interact with the system and figure out all of its features. And at the other end, uh, there are really simple improvisers, which are simple to use, but they actually don't quite give you enough control to necessarily get the kind of experience that you're looking for. So we are we started working on a system that tries to hit the right balance between ease of use and uh, and user control. 
And I'm going to show you here. So this is uh, Zach playing. And then the system responds to him. So this is how these improvisational systems typically work. All right, so th that's how in general these, these improvisational systems tend to work and we're working on sort of hitting the right balance of ease of use um, and freedom. All right, moving on to songwriting. This is actually the focus of my work. Um, started off with research that was meant to help me write songs. I have uh, sort of a little bit of a dual life, having been a singer, an opera singer, since my PhD studies in computer science. And I got stuck. I had, uh, I had a very hard time writing my own songs. And so um, ended up, uh, after discovering the field of computational creativity, redirecting my research in that direction from uh, originally from theoretical foundations of cluster analysis and um, created a system that helped me write vocal melodies. So you would give it a sentence like, it's so great to be here today, and it would give you a melody like, it's so great to be here today, and it would give me these different melodies and I would piece them together into songs. Uh, the project ended up getting a lot of attention and um, we eventually commercialized it and built a system uh, which is right now on the iOS store that helps you write lyrics, then helps convert those lyrics to vocal melodies um, and does all of that on top of a backing track. So you end up with a complete vocal song at the end of the process. Then we noticed that a lot of professionals were using our system specifically for the lyrics component. So we ended up spinning out Lyric Studio which is a system specifically designed to be like a writing, like a lyrics uh, co-writer. And it works equally well for novices who are new to lyrics writing as for professional lyricists. And we, we actually have a lot of professionals who use a system to get out of writer's block. Um, and so what's sort of uh, interesting about these systems in particular is that not only is AI capable of it has its own songwriting and lyrics writing capability, but it's designed in a way that supports human creativity. So the person makes all the decisions. Uh, the system adapts to the person's style. It's very human centric. So it's uh, AI supporting the development of human creativity by design with these with these two systems. All right, I'm going to show you a couple of fun videos now. So this one in particular uh, happened very early uh, in this research. I met uh, a brilliant conceptual artist named James Morgan. He's a professor at San Jose State University, and he always wanted to write an opera. But the challenge with that, while being a very, very talented artist, he didn't have any musical training. So he didn't know music theory and he never, uh, never actually played any musical instruments. And so when I told him about our system, uh, he got really excited. He said, can I use it to create an opera? Which I thought was an incredibly ambitious project, um, but we still, we still did it. We retrained the system on the music of Giacomo Puccini for him. And he created this beautiful Italian aria, uh, which I ended up singing. Um, and uh, him and his students put it together to Machinima Visuals. So I'm going to show you a few minutes of this Beautiful work of art right now. It's been showcased uh, in a number of museums and ex exhibitions previously.
enough for that fragment. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, now I'm going to show you another piece, the final the final piece of music for today. Uh, this one is um, one of the most recent ones we made. It's a song created about the pandemic ex ex experience uh, that we're all facing to one degree or another. And again, it's a collaboration between humans and, uh, and a machine. In, in this case, our AI system, Lyric Studio, created the lyrics together with me, uh, and the music was made by a very talented Russian composer named Igor Verkhovsky. And uh, it's called Shadows on my screen. I included some of the lyrics for you here on the right, since the lyrics is the part that's created by machine. And for me, it's really always been all about this collaboration between humans and AI, um, and using AI to help people reach um, new heights of creative expression, improve their creative abilities and also make artifacts that perhaps they could not have created by themselves or artica artifacts of higher quality. So I'm going to play a little bit of this song for you. song is easy to find. It's pretty much on all platforms, so you're welcome to hear the rest of it um, outside of this talk. Okay, so uh, I got only a couple of minutes left here, so I want to briefly talk about uh, two really cool opportunities in the intersection of musical AI and gaming. Uh, so one is motivated by the idea of casual creators introduced by Kate Compton at the International Conference on, on Computational Creativity, which is where I learned about it. And it's this idea that creativity is intrinsically satisfying. It's an intrinsic joyful experience that doesn't have to be goal oriented. And so she created a bunch of these small games, often focusing on visual art, for example, making it easy to create a really beautiful snowflake by manipulating several sliders. So in the case of casual creators, the machine does all the heavy lifting and the person is able to be creative through really simple activities that don't require any training. And again, the goal here is not to create an amazing artifact or a great piece of music, but to engage in this creative process and get this, um, get the, all the benefits of engaging in this type of enjoyable experience. I've actually seen quite a few attempts to make casual creators from music, uh, sometimes in fact more so in industry, uh, but quite a bit in academia as well. Uh, but I think that nevertheless the problem remains open. So the challenge is how do we turn music making into a game that's not goal oriented, or the goal is not to create music that you sell or even necessarily music that, that you're extremely proud of, but more a very enjoyable experience that's worth returning to where the AI does a lot of the heavy lifting and the person um, gets to nevertheless in, 
engage in this fun creative process without having to learn to be a musician without that being the goal. Uh, so I think there are real opportunities here, uh, but I haven't really seen examples that have succeeded into turning this into a really, really fun experience that people want to keep coming back to. And I think I think this will eventually get solved. And the other one is adaptive music generation. And there's a lot of work on that in uh, in academia. So a lot of researchers have looked at adaptive music generation for games, uh, but there is remarkably little of that in industry. So this opportunity hasn't really been capitalized on. There was a startup named Mellow Drive uh, that was going after this direction, but they've since redirected um, on other on other areas. Uh, so there's a real opportunity to create music that changes with the player. So each time you play it, you get different kind of music and no two players are ever going to have the same musical experience. And that way it can be designed to better support the emotional setting um, that uh, this particular player is experiencing in the game. All right, so super quick summary. The biggest opportunities is adaptive music generation and making a music casual creator. Um, and one of the biggest challenges I see, in fact, with creative AI and computational creativity in general, is this, this big gap between industry and academia. So there's really an opportunity to take a lot of insights from academia and uh, putting in the very hard work of making it into something that fits into industry because industry challenges are different from academia in many ways. Um, and so like in other parts of creative AI, there is this incredible opportunity here to bridge the gap and bring the best of both worlds and as such share musical AI and or musical AI and gaming uh, with with people at large with with the greater community. Thank you. All right, uh, thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much, Maya. Um, that was an incredible talk. It's it's very cool to see the broad range, right, of sort of ways in which human and AI can work together. I think we'll continue to get some sense of that as we move forward now with our next speaker, Mike Cook. Uh, so just to, to give him a, a brief intro, uh, and I'll note Mike's bio was too humble, which is not unusual for him, so I've had to spice it up a bit. Uh, Mike is a, a good friend of mine. He's a fantastic guy and a personal inspiration as a researcher. Um, he's currently working at Queen Mary University of London, where he holds a Royal Academy of Engineering Research Fellowship. He's a leading researcher at the intersection of computational creativity, generative systems, and game design. Uh, his research focuses on building AI agents that design games autonomously and that help people design games themselves. He is the developer of the world famous game creating AI Angelina, which in many ways popularized autonomous game generation. Uh, he's also the founder of the procedural generation jam proc jam and co-author of the MIT press book Twitterbots. And once he very narrowly missed out on holding a speed run world record. Uh, I don't think that'll come up in this talk, but who knows? Uh, I'm very much looking forward to it myself. Let's go ahead and move it over to Mike. Thank you so much, Matthew, um, and uh, thanks everyone else for having me here. It's um, it's really great to be able to, I don't know, have a chance to share some ideas with you all. Um, this talk is about things that have been on my mind lately, things that I'm thinking about right now, um, and I want to try and find out what other people think about this and and where the things that Matthew was talking about, not speed running, but automated game design might be going in the future. So when I sent this title over to uh, the organizers of this event, I was just searching for like a relatable AI reference point, you know, I, I, just something friendly that people have positive connotations towards. And it was only later that I realized that, uh, of course, many of you who worked for Microsoft at the very least are probably sick and tired of this being referenced all the time as an AI joke, but it wasn't intentional. But Cliffy won't be appearing much for the rest of this talk, I promise. Um, instead, I'm going to be talking to you about some of the research I've been doing and the things that have been on my mind lately and how I think it might affect how all of us make games or work with software in the future. Um, thank you again, Matthew, for that very, very kind introduction. So before we get too far into this talk, uh, I'm going to start by talking to you about something called the door problem. So you might be familiar with, with this if you work in a game studio or you've been somewhere like GDC before. Um, it's a kind of famous thought experiment proposed by a uh, game designer and games philosopher Liz England. Um, and Liz basically presents this idea of you're going to add a door to your video game. Um, and that sounds like a fairly ordinary, regular thing to do. Um, but then Liz goes on to list all of the considerations you might have about this door. Like, what's it going to look like? How is it going to open and close? Do you need to save the state of the door? And then Liz goes on to list 
you know, everyone else's considerations, other members of your team, perhaps, or if you're a solo developer, you know, other hats that you have to wear during the time, during the day, like uh, what style should this door be presented in? And does the PR agency need to know about this door? Um, and the, the bottom line of the door problem is that uh, essentially it's about languages. It's about speaking and communicating to people. Um, and it's about the different ways in which we think when we approach a problem and how we need to be mindful of how other people think about problems as well. And it's also about how compl complicated doors are, obviously, but um, I like to think of it as being about languages. Now, you don't have to work in the games industry for this to be a concern for you. Most people's everyday lives are about thinking about other people's perspectives on things. Um, but as an AI researcher, especially someone that works in something like computational creativity, we're often thinking about uh, speaking to AI in their language and getting AI to understand how people view things, you know, how humans view things in their own languages too. Um, and sometimes this is explicit and sometimes it's less explicit. Uh, this is a screenshot from something called A Rogue Dream, which was an experiment I cooked up a while ago now. Uh, and you would give this game a noun, like pirate, and it would try and make a game where you were playing a pirate. Um, the game didn't vary very much, but what did vary was the thematic content. So in this case, your enemies are ninjas and your health potions uh, or your health bar is parrots. So you collect parrots to heal yourself. And the game's doing this by going onto Google and looking for references and what do people associate with pirates um, and then trying to use this to, to theme the game. So this is very much an AI trying to understand the way that people view the world. Now, um, as Matthew mentioned, my main project is a piece of software called Angelina. Um, and lately I've been looking at how I can get people to speak Angelina's language, so to speak. Um, so how do we get people to contribute knowledge or communicate with this AI in a way that makes sense to those people? So Angelina can conjure up questions, which it asks people, uh, which help it expand its knowledge base. So instead of scraping information from some huge database, instead we just ask the people who interact with this software directly, like, what should I know about the world? Does, is this thing true? Do you believe this thing to be true? Um, so I've been thinking about that back and forth. And of course, the most fun thing to do with an AI is to get the AI to speak human language directly. Um, so to give you an example of that, one of the most joyous parts of uh, working on automated game designers is getting them to name those games. So these are some puns. Uh, most of them are puns on indie games, but they're referencing a different kind of noun that is in the game that Angelina's made, like Euro Duck Simulator. Um, now, there's no semantic connection. It's not actually about simulating ducks. Um, it's just there for the pun, but uh, this is basically the reason I do my job, the, the pun generation. The other 99% is just to get me to justify spending a day doing something like this. So a lot of this language exchange is really interesting, um, but one thing that I really want to do ultimately in the future um, is to have these tools be part of everyone's daily lives. And I don't just mean big game studios, I mean small game studios, I mean kids, I mean retirees. Um, people who live in countries or situations or, or places that maybe don't have access to technology that we take for granted. You know, we can't have them rely on super fast computers and access to huge server farms and things like that. So how do we put this technology into everyone's hands? And there are so many factors involved in this. Um, and I used to just talk about these as hypotheticals, but I realized uh, at some point that, you know, I've been in games research for about 10 years now. Um, and at some point, I can't just say that this is going to happen in the future. I have to actually start trying to make it happen. So um, this has been more on my mind lately. Now, when I was reading about these kinds of topics, I came across this uh, paper written in the 90s by two people, Tid and Trella, um, and they looked from a very business focused perspective about what it takes a new technology to be adopted. And they identified two features. Um, the first was comfort. So comfort says, you know, how much effort is involved in order to start using this technology? So do I need to retrain people? Do we need to change the way that we work on a day to day basis? Do we need to kind of uh, obtain new technology maybe as a new hardware or software? Um, and the second factor is credibility. So someone's told me that this new idea is going to change the way we work, but do I trust that will actually happen? Do I think my business or, or me personally will, will benefit from this new idea? Um, and these two factors make a lot of sense. They're, they are clearly central to technology uptake of all kinds. Um, but especially in automated game design or computational creativity, we often focus very much on the credibility aspect, I think. Um, and certainly that's something I focused on for a very long time, which is like, how do we convince people that Angelina, for example, can make good games? That was always the question that people ask. It's always the first criticism of the software. 
Um, but lately I've been thinking more about comfort um, because comfort isn't just a consideration for, you know, industrial transfer or something like that. Comfort is a real concern for things like automation and labor issues in the future. Um, it has research implications and research questions of its own. Um, and so I've been thinking a lot about how one might get to a point where we could interact with a creative AI on a daily basis in our jobs and, and what that would be like. So today I want to talk to you about languages um, and I want to talk to you about the custom languages that uh, automated game designers like Angelina often use. So in order to avoid them having to do something very complicated like write plain English design documents or write code themselves, we typically give these systems a cut down language that we've designed ourselves. So here's an example from Angelina. So you can see here that uh, there's a very simple description of a rule and the rule says when a player touches an enemy, uh, destroy the enemy, play a sound effect and score a point. So it's a very basic rule, but you can see here there's a lot of hidden work. Um, I had to write this language myself and decide what was going to be in that language. Uh, it needs to have an implementation somewhere. It needs to have a connection to a real game engine. Uh, any other designers, like anyone other than me using this, has to know what the limitations of the language are. They have to understand what they can express in it, what all of these things mean. Um, so there's a lot of uh, stuff going on here. Um, and also anything not in this language can't be defined. So I can't give you this system and you connect it to whatever game you're making because you, the, this system, this language isn't designed for the game that you're making. So there's a lot of issues here. Now, ideally, one of the things we might like in a, in a dream world um, would be for an AI maybe to just work as a co-worker, like a colleague, a partner, a friend, a teacher, a critic, um, any of these roles, you know, um, and they would just work on our project. So, you know, if you work in a game studio or if you've ever made a game with someone before, uh, you both have access to the same files probably, um, and they would just write code if they wanted to, to show you an idea. So to translate that previous example from the previous slide into code, it might look something like this. Doesn't matter if uh, you read this code or not, it's not important, but um, this is a translation of the previous slide into C sharp code or an example of it. But this, uh, this feels like it would be too difficult. I actually said just now, that's actually why we don't do it because code generation is just a big task. Um, but I've begun to think lately about how we might achieve this. Um, and the thing I've ended up calling it is code-based automated game design. So the idea here is that this is a way to integrate complicated AI in a way that is very natural. It fits into the kind of tools that we already use. So it has a high comfort level in that uh, terminology we were talking about earlier. But at the same time, because it's connecting directly to your game, um, it can touch your game code directly and execute it. There's actually potential for it to be even more credible. It can actually have more of an impact and hopefully design more interesting and targeted and focused um, ideas. So I think there's benefits in, in both ways from doing this. Um, and we're not gonna walk through like a super deep worked example here today, but for the next few slides, I'm gonna show you an example of how I think this works. And you can think of a use case as, you know, you're making a new MMO or a MOBA or something like that. And you've got this new character like Blizzard uh, working on Overwatch 2 right now. You've got this new character and you want them to have a new special ability. So the player presses a button and some code executes. And our AI could come up with ideas for that uh, in theory. This is, uh, this is stepping into the future of code-based automated game design. So how would that work? You're, you're a designer, you're sat down, you don't know anything about AI, you don't really want to know anything about AI, you just want to design a game. So what would that look like? So the way I've been working on it is you sit down to your regular game code base and you add tags to any code that you think the AI might want to use. So this usable tag basically says to the AI, you're allowed to call this method or use this data. And if there's some code which looks like uh, you might not want the AI to use it, um, you can leave no tag at all. Um, and sometimes we can add kind of constraints. So these, these tags, um, which are called attributes in C-sharp, can have extra data attached to them. So this one says, okay, you can use this method, but you can only use it once uh, in your generated code. So don't like go calling this 10 times or anything like that. So it's very simple. It's just a little, just a one line of code written into the game's regular code base. And then we go to kind of where we want this code to be inserted in our game, for example, in the input handling code. Um, and we use something called a delegate. Now, again, I didn't want this talk to delve into the technicalities of generating code, although maybe if you want, you could always ask a question about that in the Q&A. But the idea is you're gonna write something somewhere that says, I want the AI to put some code here in my game. Um, and those two interactions are 
kind of the extent of it. There's a little bit extra. There's the testing and evaluation part, which I don't have time to go into here. Um, but in terms of the basics of interacting with this AI, this is mostly what you would be doing. You'd be labeling bits of the code base that you want it to use and then telling it where you want the code that it generates to end up. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but thinking about these interactions, thinking about it in terms of comfort, you know, you're not opening up a separate uh, application. And just to add a little bit of more technical salt on the top, the way this works is AI uses something called reflection to look through our code base and it looks for anything that has the usable tag. Now, again, this code is just here. If you're curious, uh, you don't need to understand what it means, but essentially it's looking through our code base for these tags that we've left and it's adding this to a list of saying, okay, I'm allowed to use this data, I'm allowed to call this method. And then later on when it generates the code, it'll go back to this list of things that it's allowed to use, kind of like giving it puzzle pieces or Lego bricks and saying, okay, make me a castle out of these bricks. Kind of. um, and the nice thing about this is that it feels kind of normal. It feels like everyday code kind of. Um, you're basically just adding a few lines, tagging data, um, and then telling the AI to get on with it. And I really like that. And I think this has potential as an interaction method. However, as with all talks that have a three act structure, there is a, a twist, there is a, there's a, a caveat. Um, and the caveat has to do with specification. So you might not have heard about specification before, but specification is basically a way of describing how we expect code to behave. Now, some types of specification are what we call formal. So if you studied computer science, you might have done classes where you write down logical statements about code and prove that an ATM is safe or a vending machine does something. But essentially this is using logic or math to prove things about the behavior of code um, or to describe very formally what, what code should do. Now, typically, especially if you're a game developer, especially if you're an indie game developer who's pushed for time um, and has better things to be doing, uh, a lot of concerns uh, besides formal specification, we don't always as humans worry too much about formal specification. Um, instead, what we tend to worry more about is informal specification. So informal specification is any time you speak or write or even think something about code um, that is not you know, logic or maths in any way. So for instance, uh, git commit messages. So I've left a message here telling people that uh, I've added a parameter that destroys half of the code base. Uh, this is informal specification. It's just a, a text message, basically. Um, conversations with your friends on Slack, on Twitter, uh, in real life, when someone used to walk over to your desk and ask you a quick question. Um, all of these things are informal specification. And of course, the most common form is written in the code itself. So code comments are informal specification, uh, even things like the names of methods. Um, so here I've written something which is called positive numbers only, please. Um, this is definitely not formal. It's really just an instruction to the, to the humans that are writing code. So where's the catch? Well, the catch is that when our AI system uses reflection and it comes to this method and we said it can use it, uh, it doesn't see the comment, it doesn't see the Slack messages or the git commits, it doesn't even see the name of the method really. I mean, it does, but it doesn't know what it means. What it essentially sees is this. It's a method that takes a number and gives you a number in return. That's all it knows about it. So because we rely on informal specification as people, uh, that means we don't have any formal specification left for our AI to read. So uh, last year I wrote a paper suggesting that one of the ways in which we might solve this problem is to introduce slightly different ways of software engineering. So in the same way that the door problem encourages us to think about how we communicate with other people, we might start rewriting our code to communicate differently with our AI assistants. So let's uh, have this example of we're writing a roguelike and in our roguelike we're moving around on a grid and we want to make sure that we only move one tile at a time. Well, if we write this function um, that has just, it just takes X and Y, we can just hope that the human programmer will only pass one or minus one to these X and Y coordinate changes. But our AI might not use that. So instead, we could make this safer to stop the AI from making a mistake by formalizing that constraint. So we can define a new type and the type can describe uh, compass points. And now when the AI tries to call this method, it can only give compass points. It can't give like 100,000 as one of the numbers or minus 8,000 million. Um, it can only give north, south, east or west. So we've formalized that a little bit. We've, we've added some more structure that helps the AI understand what this code is for. But of course the caveat has a caveat, <laughs> um, which is that reliability for AI often comes at the cost of inventiveness. So by rewriting that code to be safer, we've also potentially stopped the, the machine from being really, really novel and inventive. So if we take this move on grid example, um, 
when we had it as two integers, um, integers can be all kinds of data could be passed in here. So our AI might have come up with a special move where the player moves a distance based on how much gold they have because gold is an integer and it's asking for an integer in the method. And so that's a perfectly valid use of this method. But as soon as we change it to compass points, the AI can't do that anymore. It, we've lost its ability to kind of go off piece in a way. So what I suspect will end up happening is that different people will use these AI assistants in different ways. Some of them will kind of let them go wild and give them freedom of reign over their code base. And others will try and shape it a bit more carefully to sort of focus what it can do and when it can do it. And there's still plenty of things it can invent there, but it's unlikely to crash or delete the backup server or things like that. Um, I'm obviously more in favor of the one that can potentially delete the backup server because it's more exciting, but I understand that if you're running a business or something, you might not want to do that. So it's important to say that um, I don't think that these ideas are going to you know, solve AI game design forever. I haven't just suddenly made a link between academic research and uh, everyday game development, um, but I think it shows how we can increase the comfort level of working with these systems. And kind of like I said at the beginning, at the same time, it doesn't just increase how comfortable we feel when using these AI, but it also potentially allows us to um, develop systems which are a bit more creative or a bit more um, unpredictably inventive um, than automated game design systems often are. And this is, uh, I'm going to give you a, a short example in a minute, but one of the problems with the custom languages that we would often write for software like Angelina is that when we're writing these languages, we're often giving it the primitives that we think are useful. So you saw earlier in the previous example how um, there was a rule for when a player touches an enemy, then destroy the enemy. That concept of two things touching one another or destroying something, these are all pre-decided pre keywords that I had to give the system. So I was already shaping the kinds of things it could do. But this example that you're seeing in front of you is a, from this different approach. So I built a bejeweled prototype, kind of a generic mobile game outline template. Um, and then I said to the system, OK, invent me games where player interaction causes something to happen. So when the player taps or swipes, you generate some code that says what happens at that point. Um, and there were already functions in there for like swapping a piece or in, or touching a piece or getting data from a piece, but I didn't tell it what to do. I was just essentially giving it access to the game's API. So what it came up with was kind of cool. So you're seeing a grid of numbers here. When you swipe two numbers, you're going to see a, a little animation in a minute. Uh, instead of swapping their locations, it subtracts the first number from the tile that you're swiping it into. So you'll see that there's a tile number three near the center of the grid. Watch what happens when I swipe the two onto it. So two subtracted from three makes one. That creates a column of one which explodes and causes it to cascade down. So it's turned this bejeweled clone into a kind of educational maths puzzle game, which is surprisingly fun. Um, now, this game may already exist. It may just be that I wasn't aware of it. But uh, even if it does, I, I think it's it was an encouraging and cool example. It wasn't something I would have thought of before. And it was made possible, in my opinion at least, because the system was accessing this code directly. So it was able to access data and functions without me having to think, you know, what are the implications of this? You know, I can just tag these things as usable and the system will go off and have fun with them. So it's a really small example, but it's one that I, I really like showing. So what I'm hoping is that over time, we'll find a way to extend uh, Liz's door problem with a new line um, where we'll not just think about what everyone, all of the other humans in our department are worrying about or thinking about the game, but we'll also think about how our AI assistants perceive the game as well. And I know this sounds like a big gimmick, um, but it really is emblematic of how I view or how the, my hope for the future of our interactions with AI. But we think about AI as a complementary um, member of the team almost, rather than something happening in the background or worse, something kind of making our lives worse by replacing us or getting rid of parts of the job that we love. Um, but that challenge is, you know, that comes with new challenges like figuring out how to explain to an AI what a door is. So uh, I think I'm about right for time. Um, I just thought I'd close by giving you the big opportunity and the big challenge. So Clippy's appeared to help me with the end. Um, the big opportunity for me AI is something that's affecting everyone's lives in very serious ways. But we work in games, we work in creative areas, and that means that we can give people a chance to play AI, play with AI, break AI down, uh, see the flaws, see how they're made of, see their limitations, and it's a safe place to do that. So I think we really need to embrace our kind of social obligation to helping people understand these things which are changing their lives in so many different ways. 
And in terms of the challenge, um, I think one of the concerns with automation is not just about people losing their jobs, but about people losing a connection to processes, even things like adding a filter to Photoshop automatically. Um, we want to make sure that we don't lose connections to the practices and processes that people really love. And those can often be very surprising, you know, the things that we miss or the things that we value about our day-to-day -day lives. So that's the challenge for me, is how can we use AI to improve those things without reducing them to kind of waving magic wands? Thank you so much for listening. I'll obviously be here for the Q&A, but if you want to chat with me at any point, I'm always open to uh, conversations and so is Clippy. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Mike. That was fantastic, uh, as expected. Um, uh, I, I'm very much into this sort of thing we already have going on in terms of sort of the different ways you can have humans and AI working together. And I think, I suspect, that we're going to get a little bit more of that as we move on to our, our final speaker for the day, Mikhail Jacob. Um, so he's our last speaker for this session. Uh, after that, of course, we'll have a plenary session after this. Um, and he will be continuing the sort of through line of human AI interaction. Um, now, Mikhail has also done a poor job of bragging about himself in his bio, so I've had to write him a new one. Uh, now, Mikhail and I have been colleagues, peers, and friends for quite nearly a decade as we both undertook research originally with Dr. Brian McGurko at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, Mikhail received his PhD working with the Expressive Machine Lab at Georgia Tech in 2019. And during his PhD, Mikhail worked on a number of installations bringing together humans with AI, um, which means that his AI agents have had perhaps the most real world impact of anyone in the session. Uh, these installations have received awards and honors from the Smithsonian, the Newcomb Institute, and from G Virginia Institute of Technology. Most recently, Miguel received a Best Paper Award from the Artificial Intelligence and Digital Entertainment Conference, which is the top AI and games conference, uh, last year for some incredible work uh, on the challenges stopping game developers from benefiting more from and developing with AI, uh, which I think we'll be hearing more about a bit during this presentation. Uh, with that, I'll go ahead and leave it up to Miguel. You're muted, Mikhail. Yeah. Wow, that is probably the best intro I've ever gotten. So thanks, Matthew. Um, and thanks everyone for having me here. It's really an honor to be speaking here at this wonderful event. Um, so as Matthew said, I'm Mikhail uh, and welcome from Cambridge in the UK. Uh, and this is my talk on human AI co-creation for games and game creators. It's a bit of a high level talk because I'll cover a lot of the stuff Matthew talked about and hopefully some new work as well. Um, so it might be rushing a little bit, hopefully not, but maybe. Uh, so, you know, as Anastasia said, don't blink or you'll miss something interesting. All right. So my talk today will cover some of the interesting possibilities when we use artificial intelligence as part of our creative processes or creative practice. This is also known as human AI co-creation. I'm going to talk about my original res research in this space, but really, the use of AI techniques is already a part of our creative processes today. We already use AI techniques to explore new ideas and get inspiration. This is an example from PowerPoint design ideas, which like Christoph in the previous session, I also love. And this is its creation for a slide for our development sprint review, which the system took quite literally. We also use it to automate away some of the tedium in our creative work. This is content aware fill in Photoshop. There are even examples where systems can collaborate with us to create original creative outputs that would not have been possible without each collaborator, human or agent. This one is an example called Drawing Apprentice, where you can take turns to create abstract sketch art with an agent. But how do we apply co-creation to games and game creators? I'll be talking about that today in two parts. First, I'll talk about how we can apply this co-creative process to generating emergent gameplay with game characters. Then I'll talk more about how we can apply some human AI co-creation to the actual process of making games itself. Fantastic. Let's dive into co-creating gameplay with agents and see how far we can take this concept. Well, as an extreme example, why not just let the characters in the game make everything up as they go? Let them really co-create the gameplay with you while you play it. I'm talking, of course, about improvisation. These are all real world creative practices where people co-create a story or a play or a scene or just expressive improvised interactions together in real time without clearly specified goals or too many hard constraints. So why don't we have games where all the agents can make things up as they go 
roll with your creative punches and serve up their own creative offers to make something interesting. Because, as it turns out, it's really hard. This applies to human improvisation too, in many cases. There are many challenges that improvisers face, real or virtual. Let me tell you about two key problems that I think are particularly important for AI improvisers. I'll do that by showing you two game experiences we built where we tackle these specific problems and enable you to improvise with your AI. This work was done with my previous colleagues in the Expressive Machinery Lab at Georgia Tech. For our first problem, let's talk about improvisation in partner dancing. Partner dance is ubiquitous around the world. It's usually improvisational. There's a focus on acting and reacting to your partner. So we were interested in creating improvisational partner dancing games where the agent didn't just use a fixed set of moves or expect you to learn its moves before you could really dance together. But the primary problem we faced was the knowledge authoring bottleneck. This is the problem of needing a vast amount of knowledge authored by the system designer before the agent can do anything interesting at all. In this example, the robot knows exactly three things to respond with, so it can keep doing them again and again. But as in life, that makes a really boring dancer. Our solution was to learn from our users, learn to dance with future users by observing current users, learn not just dance moves, but how to sequence these moves together sensibly. We used a few different tricks to make this work. When we learned gestures from people, we clustered them together so we could reason about how to, use, how to use them at a higher level of abstraction. Then, in order to understand how to sequence these gesture clusters together, the agent learned patterns for using them by watching how human, humans responded to its moves. By observing how people reacted to the agent's actions, it could tell how to react to future partners if they did a move similar to what it just did. And since learning those patterns of interaction required a lot of interaction, in many cases, the agent didn't rec recognize what the user was doing. For these novel situations, the agent used procedural strategies for generating responses like mimicry or imitation, transforming some element of their action and using it, or recalling similar but different dance moves from the past and using that. Sorry, that was the slide. Uh, so here's a demo of what that looked like in action in the Lumini installation. Note how the agent starts moving beyond mimicry and imitation when they start dancing in rhythm. Right, the main thing you can take away from this work is that the knowledge authoring bottleneck for improvisation can be avoided by carefully learning as much as you can from your users as quickly as possible. You can find more detail about the Lumini installation in the papers and videos at the link above. Lumini was a novel game experience and was successful at improvising dance with an agent but it is still quite far from agents that can improvise anything like the structure and narrative needed for many games. So taking some further baby steps in that direction, we decided to look at simplified improv theater. Specifically, we were interested in creating a heavily constrained version of the short form improv game called Props. The Props game has actors receive a prop, usually an abstract prop of some kind, and pretend that it is a real or fictional object. Then they use that pretend object in a scene or a story or just a comedic one line interaction between partners. That's the version we targeted. Importantly, the game is widely open ended and your choice of actions is not restricted by clear goals or hard constraints. The only real constraint is the prop and what it reminds you of. This is relevant to studying the other key challenge for improvisation with AI, the improvisational action selection problem, that is, how can an agent choose actions in near real time from an extraordinarily large number of options without clearly defined goals or constraints? 
Inspired by the various arcs that can be perceived, perceived in other art forms, we proposed a general method for motivating action selection in these incredibly open-ended improvisational settings, and we call this creative arc negotiation. In this case, a system designer provides the agent with a target creative arc to follow. This is not a list of actions to follow, but a set of target values for the novelty, unexpectedness, and quality estimates of the agent's actions during improvisation. Then, while imp improvising, as long as the agent is following these target values along the arc, balanced by estimates of the human's actions, of course, it can do the first action that it comes up with. Let's take an example. Given a rising creative arc, the agent will be tasked at first with selecting actions that are not normal and quite typical based on the prop. Over time, it will be tasked with choosing pretend objects and actions that are increasingly more novel and unexpected. To implement this in practice, we needed four main ideas. First, we collected a set of pretend objects and actions to use with these props by bringing people into our lab and asking them to show us what they could do with their props. We then trained a deep generative model called a conditional variational autoencoder on this data to generate action variants, taking into, consider, taking into consideration the physical attributes of the prop while doing so. We also used computational models of novelty, unexpectedness, and quality from the research literature to evaluate both the humans and the agent's actions and arrive at some numbers for the agent to reason about while following this creative arc. We also needed an extended version of the procedural response strategies that I mentioned previously from Lumini, like imitation, pattern application, and transformation. And we adapted these to work with this deep uh, generative model instead of the original architecture. Finally, using these strategies, the agent could generate as many action variations as time permitted, evaluate them, and choose the one closest to the target creative arc. To see this in action, we created a virtual reality installation called the Robot Improv Circus, where people could play the props game with a virtual agent. This game takes place in a huge virtual circus tent with carnival music and a sold out audience. Incredibly mixed metaphor, but it works, trust me. Everyone is a robot to level the playing field of user expectations. Here's what it looks like in action. We have created an interactive installation using virtual reality for people to play the props game as robots with a virtual improviser agent. After familiarizing themselves with the game in a trial round, during their turn, the human is given a prop and has 30 seconds to perform as many pretend actions using that prop as possible. After completing each action, they hit a buzzer, incrementing their score before passing the prop to the agent when their time is up. When the agent receives the prop, it improvises actions using the same prop for 30 seconds, incrementing its score after each action is completed. In order to better interpret the agent's actions, the intended action and object are announced using a speech bubble and audio. When the agent completes its turn, the round ends and a new prop is given to the human for their next round. The game ends after a fixed number of rounds are complete. I do enjoy watching that. Uh, two things to point out. First, this video was made before we changed our game format. Being asked to do so many, I mean, as many actions as you can in 30 seconds encouraged people to ignore their partner and just think of actions for their next round while their partner was performing. Not exactly co-creative. And secondly, even though the agent and human don't communicate directly or explicitly outside of the agent's speech bubble and voice, the agent is still using the evaluation of the human's actions while negotiating its creative arc. So the takeaway from this work is that improvisational action selection is a big hairy problem, but you can do it to some extent using creative arc negotiation. You can find more detail about the robot improv circus and this approach in general in papers and other videos at the link above. Okay, so let's recap. Within a game, we can co-create and even in some limited way improvise with AI to create emergent gameplay. But what if we want to co-create games themselves with AI, not just what happens once we build them? There's been a lot of great research in the space from procedural, procedural content generation and many other perspectives. In fact, most of the speakers at this talk series have work in this space in some point or the other, including people in this very session. 
I'm looking at you, Mike and Matthew. But as with the other parts of my talk, I'm going to focus specifically on game agents and co-creating their behaviors with AI. In the last year and a half, I've gotten the opportunity to do just that with Microsoft Research, and the rest of my talk is work done with my colleagues at MSR. So being at MSR, there was a huge opportunity to focus on co-creating game agents with real developers. So how do we help them co-create agents with AI? Part of it could be to use reinforcement, imitation, or various other machine learning methods to get the agents to learn how to play the games themselves. But given how new these techniques are for commercial use, we also don't really know what it would take for game creators to use these AI techniques in a real world game development context outside of a research lab. What challenges, oops, what challenges do these game creators face with their game AI tools right now? And what opportunities could there be for AI to support them in their current practices or in entirely new workflows that might use techniques like reinforcement learning? To get some answers, we studied a small sample of game agent designers and developers who use either traditional game AI techniques or RL from across the industry. We conducted semi-structured interviews with them, asking about the challenges they faced in their work processes and with their current technologies. We then used thematic analysis to understand the responses. So in our AID 2020 conference paper, we describe some of the challenges and opportunities that we surfaced for creating game agents in commercial games. And we talk about them from three key themes around their design, implementation, and evaluation. I'll briefly discuss a select few opportunities that we highlighted in our paper. Firstly, there is an inherent tension between authorial control and agent autonomy. Since RL agents have stronger autonomy than say behavior trees, allowing designers to exert more expressive control over RL agents is a fantastic opportunity to support agent co-creation with RL. Another opportunity for supporting agent co-creation with RL is in adapting agents across different levels or level types or even different games in say you know a sequence uh, a, a sequence of games generalization is a known challenge for rl but perhaps commercial games are the perfect challenge problem for targeting research breakthroughs in this space across the board automating game testing at massive scale was highlighted as a key opportunity for rl agents this would free up the designer or developer to focus on other aspects of their creative process. There are many more of these challenges and opportunities in our paper, so I'm just going to tease you and turn to the next slide, and you can read more about it at the link on top. The big takeaway here is that game agent co-creation with RL and other learning-based approaches faces many challenges, but also offers many opportunities for research and product impact. You can find more details, as I mentioned, from our study in the paper, as well as a convenient talk video that's shorter at the link above. Let's talk about one of those problems in particular, designer control and agent autonomy. As a result of our previous study, we decided to understand designer control and agent autonomy further. Rather than having designers learn how to use RL the way it currently works, how could we redesign RL workflows to meet designers where they were and adapt, their, adapt to their requirements, making it more useful to them? In fact, making it more designer-centered. Last year, I was fortunate enough to mentor a fantastic intern, Batu Itemis, who worked with us on this problem as part of his research internship at Microsoft Research Cambridge. This work shows some first steps towards a designer-centered approach to RL by enabling designers to customize and tweak the aesthetic styles of their agents with a more intuitive workflow than the traditional approach. Let's take this example on screen. The designer starts with an agent that successfully completes the task of, of racing to its goal as quickly as possible. But trying to get there quickly incentivizes it to navigate by dragging along the walls. And let's say for the purposes of example in this game, that looks terrible. So a designer wants to tweak its style to follow a more appropriate path like this one. How do we make this possible for the designer? We can start by using techniques like preference learning so that the designer doesn't need to know much about RL in order to make these changes. 
Preference learning, like this version we implemented from Cristiano and others, learns to model the user's preferences between different behaviors and provides the agent an extra reward component in addition to the original task reward. In this case, it's style reward. Great, so we have a style reward that uh, helps it learn the designer's style, but when trading off between task and style rewards, a badly configured weighting between them can lead to extreme behavior or even reward hacking, like these two examples that we conveniently found in our research. And the example on the right is actually staying as far as away as it can on the right. So we robustly combine the task and style rewards at many different weightings using potential based reward shaping. Unfortunately, I don't have time to explain in detail how this technique works, but you can read more about it in the blog post at the link above. And finally, at this point, we have an agent that much more robustly combines task and style, uh, given some weighting between them. But a designer still needs to provide some weights for the two reward components. And they don't have any meaningful context for how they should set these up or what these weights even mean. So instead, we use an automatic reward scaling scheduler to replace the two weights with a minimum acceptable task reward threshold. The designer provides a th threshold and the scheduler then increases the style reward automatically as long as the minimum task reward is preserved. So then the, uh, so then the thing you can take away from this work with Batu is that designer-centered RL workflows enable designers to assert expressive or stylistic control over autonomous characters. You can find more details about this above. So there are four key insights I'd like you to take away from my, take away from my talk today but we can summarize them even further as the following challenge and opportunity. First, we need more human-centered research into these AI techniques before they can be widely adopted in the game industry. Mike mentioned comfort and credibility, that's very applicable here. Secondly, once we get human AI co-creation tools out of the lab and into the hands of creators, we will have a huge opportunity to see what magic they create. Thank you for attention. You can reach me at these links. Fantastic. Uh, thanks so much, Miguel. Uh, some really interesting stuff going on here uh, and some stuff that I had not seen before, which is very exciting for me personally. Um, thank you all for these talks today. So we have about nine-ish minutes until we're supposed to stop. Uh, and we have a heck of a lot of questions. I've filled up two pages here. So uh, I'm going to try to focus on the questions that everybody can have some answers to just you know to, to do as broad as possible um so i'm going to start off with this one uh which i'm gonna it's actually a few questions so i'm gonna sort of generalize over it which is basically to ask all of you put forward really interesting systems where you had or prospective systems where you had humans and ai working together to produce something right whether that's code whether that's uh you know behavior whether that's music right so there's a number of questions in the the chat about who owns that, right? Uh, who gets that IP? How does this work? What are the problems that might come up? I'm sure you've all at least given some thought to this. So if you have any thoughts, we'd love for you to hear them now. Yeah, I've had to think a lot about this, having two commercial products out. Uh, so what I've decided is that whenever possible, you give all the IP to the person uh, for many reasons. It's simple, it's, uh, it, remove the big barrier to people wanting to use the systems. Uh, so with Lyric Studio, we give all the rights to the person. Um, with Alicia, it's a little tricky because there's some human made music in the loop. So when mm. that happens, uh, still you kind of, we still make it easy to purchase full commercial rights. So ultimately you err on the side of giving, giving the user more rights. <laughs> That's my belief. Mike or Mikhail, any thoughts there? Uh, I could take that. Um, so in, in some of my systems, you find an interesting perspective where uh, it's not just a one on one kind of human AI relationship. You also have a third party an audience or spectators or, you know, you have this perspective of the system designer or for the improvisation installation versus the people using it, the participants. So there's, I think, three kinds of users in this case or people. Um, and so it's really interesting to think about who gets credit there. Um, and I, I do think that for a large part, I have thought about it in the past as, you know, being the system designer because, you know, a lot of the actual work comes from there. But more recently, I have been changing my thought and I, I do think that we need systems for sharing IP and credit between the participants as well. 
um, maybe less so with the audience, depending on the experience, um, but definitely participants and the system designers. Yeah. It's been uh, interesting. I've, I've been working in computational creativity for about a decade now, but uh, it's only in the last 12 months that law researchers have started to contact me. And I've had <laughs> conversations with at least three different groups in the last 12 months, um, including a really interesting uh, group related to the European Commission. Um, so it's clearly something that's on people's minds. Uh, one thing that I wanted to add to the great points made by everyone else, and I agree with Maya that the individual, I think for me, I, I default to that. But one of the ways of been building these systems is so that they don't bring much, they don't take much from elsewhere. So the idea with the, with the systems I'm building is that you're the, you're the one putting stuff into the system anyway. So it's much more straightforward to say, yes, the IP is yours because it's only working with stuff that you've given it, hopefully, or your community. Yeah, yeah. some great points all around. Uh, really appreciate those perspectives. Okay, I'm gonna try to squeeze in two more questions and see if we can do it. Um, the first one, um, this is mostly for Mikhail and Maya, um, and this is around sort of health benefits. So I'm, again, combining a few questions here. Um, but for Maya particularly, there's questions around, could this be used for therapy, for example? Um, for Mikhail, there's questions around, you know, could this be used for, same thing, but physical therapy, right? Um, asking you to stretch in certain ways, use particular muscles, or do you take this into account at all, right, when you're designing these systems? Uh, Maya, you're muted. Okay, <laughs> uh, the short answer is yes, it can be used for therapy. In fact, I think that music making is used for therapy anyways by everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, but more explicitly, we did um, a bereavement study at the University of Dundee last year, and we actually showed that there are concrete psychological benefits as far as helping people to access complex emotions when they write songs. And the good thing is that this type of technology makes songwriting or lyrics writing widely accessible, and we're doing a lot more work delving into the therapy side of things. Very cool. Well, um, we haven't actually done any explicit work with as uh, with this as a form of therapy, but we've definitely thought about many applications that fall in that you know space. Um, so especially with the improv work, there was uh, ideas about you know forming play therapy and how this kind of pretend you know computational pretense could be a part of maybe research into um, autism and working with children you know to practice fantasy or pretending. Mm -hmm. um, but because pretending is a skill that's difficult for a lot of people um, with on the spectrum. Um, excuse my lack of you know knowledge about terminology here. Um, but another I think another idea is also about you know what, what this means for uh, community. You know people are stuck at home alone um, and there's video chat. Um, but one of the interesting things about a lot of the technology that we've been using, you know, we're collecting data from people. So you're not you're not ever dancing alone. You're dancing with everyone who's ever danced with the system. So I think poetically, there's something really nice there. Um, but yeah, you know, music therapy, play therapy, um, uh, even with dance and you know that that application as well. Yeah. Very cool. Um, OK, so one last question I'm going to try to, to squeeze in. Uh, we have about three minutes left. Um, this is again for everybody. So we had a number of questions about evaluation. Now, you all have proposed really interesting and very diverse systems, right, where we'd have humans and, and AI working together. But sometimes that human may not be an expert evaluator, right? Uh, we've talked about casual creators that Maya brought up. Um, from Kate Compton. So how do we do evaluation in these cases, right? Um, if you have any thoughts on how we could do this without, you know, having a human expert live there to evaluate the kind of creative work, I think that people will be really interested to hear that. For game design, I like to look at uh, how you can specify through play or evaluate through play. So one of the ways in which these mechanic designing systems can work is you come across an unsolvable problem and then you ask the system to give you a tool that would solve the problem. So I like the idea that, you know, kids kids make Minecraft levels that are instant death anyway, right? So you can imagine, you know, making a level that's impossible to solve and then asking the AI, now give me an item that lets me get through this, you know? So that's like a playful way of doing it. Fantastic. And um, in the installation world, um, I do believe we've done many different kinds of in, you know, evaluation work. So some of it is you know, having the system actually collaborate with an expert. Um, and we had a short collaboration with a uh, choreographer in Atlanta, um, and we came up with an AI human dance performance. Um, and so as a part of that collaboration, you get a lot of you know, longer term working with the AI kind of knowledge. You know, where does it suffer? Where does it grade? What ideas does it give you? 
So maybe that's something different that I can contribute, yeah. Yeah, evaluation really comes in at so many different phases. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, like like most CC researchers, we have evaluation within the system itself at various phases, uh, but ultimately it sort of resonates with what, with what Mike said. It, it's about the user experience, it's about enabling, um, well, in my case, enabling the user to express themselves more fully through songwriting or lyrics writing. And it, I'm actually explicitly OK with the fact that some that one user might love a piece of music they created and another one would not <laughs> find acceptable. And that's that's a good thing. Um, so in, in fact, the more my system is able to support people with very different tastes, uh, the more successful it is. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so we're officially out of time. Uh, thank you all so much again. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mikhail. Uh, with that, it's the end of the session. Uh, for those of you in the audience, please go ahead and move over to the Game Studio plenary session. There's a new link that you'll be able to find in the chat. Um, and thank you all again for taking part. This has been a blast. Bye. Thank you.